The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at www.dallasgenealogy.org. Lisa, I call up our Director of Education, Lisa. Very quickly before I introduce today's wonderful speaker, uh, I just want to let everybody know next month, uh, which I believe our meeting is going to be February 2nd, um, we have Ari Wilkins uh, from the library here who's going to be talking about incorporating oral histories into our research. So today we have the wonderful Bernard Miser, a PhD. He's a genealogist and lecturer based in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. He began researching his family over 25 years ago and enjoys sharing lessons learned from those experiences including his mistakes. <laughs> Although he knew only one grandparent, his maternal grandfather, he has successfully identified all of his great-great-grandparents and several triple and quadruple great-grandparents. He's past president and social media chair of the Mid-Cities Genealogical Society and is a member of the National Genealogical Society and the Texas State Genealogical Society. If you could help me welcome Bernard Meisner. Thank you, Lisa. Right. Got my phaser on stun here. <laughs> and may want to take the chance to make sure all your phones are off. I guarantee you your ancestors will not be calling in the next hour or so. Because I talked to them earlier today. <laughs> uh, as Lisa mentioned, I'm with Mid-Cities Geological Society. Uh, we're Hearst, Bedford, Euless, and Irving is where we generally draw our, our folks from. Uh, we meet in the Euless Library when the Euless Library is meetable in. Uh, they are in the process of a complete remodel of the library. They're down to the four walls. And it'll probably be April of next year where they finally get it open again. So we meet right now in the uh, Euless Police Training Room. So it's right by the jail. So <laughs> anybody acts up, we know how to take care of you. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the state and territorial censuses and to sort of show again we start with you know the original part of the United States and then gradually acquired a whole lot more uh, including my little nemesis here in the corner uh, I was a teacher for many years and always pointed out that the examinations are part of the learning process and the only thing I remember about a geography test in sixth grade is the answer I got wrong, which was this darn Gadsden purchase down here that we ended up buying from Mexico in 1853. They had already done the Transcontinental Railroad, and there'll be lots of ceremonies this year because it's the 150th anniversary of that. But the Southern Pacific in particular was looking for a more southern route for a cross country. Uh, route and this was all sort of mountainous and it was sort of flatter down here railroads like flat land So they ended up buying that from Mexico and now everywhere I go I keep running into this I worked for the Forest Service in Riverside, California for a while and our training center was in Marana, Arizona Just outside of Tucson and every time I would drive there on Interstate 10 I'd stop at the one rest stop where they had this big display of you are now in the Gadsden purchase <laughs> Jesus Christ. And it'll pop up again today as well. Uh, first one thing I want to point out, I'm be talking today about the state and territorial censuses. And just so you can differentiate between a census and census substitutes, and I'll talk a little bit about those as well. In a census, you're really trying to survey the whole population. Uh, you at least get heads of households, if not an every name sort of census and usually get some information about them as well. Census substitutes are anything else that there might be that will place a number of people at a certain place at a certain time. Uh, I'm more Irish than I am German, and the one issue we have in Ireland is all the 1800 censuses are gone. So you have to find census substitutes, and it even gets down to things like dog licenses which are records that are kept here in this country as well. But because we have the census, as genealogists, we don't worry about those. But if they take away your census, even something like a voter's list, any sort of tax list or something is a substitute. But today I'll be concentrating again primarily on censuses. 
And the motivation, how this talk sort of started out, I was giving a talk at my uh, local Mid-City Society, tracking my dad's Aunt Clara and her family. And I happened to point out, well, one of the places I found them was in the New York State Census of 1915. And somebody in the back of the room said, huh, state census? What is this? And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, oh, this could be a whole other presentation. So here we are. Uh, some of the things they had in kind of the questions, uh, they were asking if they were born in the United States or a foreign country, a uh, number of years they've been in the United States, and were they citizens or aliens. So number of years in the United States is not something they ask on the federal census, but for genealogists, that could be sort of important if you're looking for immigration, to when did they come in? Well, here would be one way to find out. Uh, another thing they did, if you look at the enumerator's instructions, and anytime you look at a census, you want to go back and look at what did they tell the enumerators? What were they supposed to record? How were they supposed to record it? So you just don't take at face value what shows up on the census record. And it was sort of interesting, in 1950 in New York, they said, okay, if, the, if an infant under one year of age tells exactly how many days old it is on the census day, and if it wasn't born at the current residence where the family is on June 1st, tell us what city or village or state it was in, and if it was a city or village, what was the house number where the infant was born? So that would be a great piece of information you'd want to have, uh, which is available in the state census, not available on the federal census. Okay, so if we look at state and territorial censuses, a lot of them were done in the 1800s, in many cases on sort of the, the by years. I always talk about by year elections, if you follow, in England, so on the fives, the 55, 65, 75. But there were a number that were also done in the 1900s. And you can see in places like South Dakota, they did every five years all the way up to 1945. I found my one friend in Florida in 1945. He was born after 1940. This is now 2019. So we've only got a couple more years to go to get to 2022 and the 1950 census gets released. But if you have people born between 40 and 50 in the early part of the 40s, there are some places where you can already get records about them that are not available yet in the federal census. Some of the cases, in addition to the population census, they also did those other supplemental schedules, the agriculture, the manufacture, and the mortality. The mortality was who's died in the last year up to the day of the census. So that would be information you could pick up on some of these off years, as opposed to just the 1870s, 80s, and the like. They can supplement, therefore, the decennial federal records. And of course, we lost a good bit of 1890, but there were a number of state and territorial censuses done, 85, 92, or 95, that helped fill in that gap. Otherwise, you're so sort of, look, I got them in 1880, and I got them in 1900, but what happened in between? Where did people disappear to? Uh, Clara was one of those because she was not living with the family in 1900. So I was going, where did she go? Well, she got married, moved to New York. Again, they ask often different and more detailed questions. New York always said, what county were they born in? Not just, oh, they're born in New York, which could help you zero in. In Rhode Island in 65, what town were they born in? And in Massachusetts, were they native born or naturalized voters? So if they were naturalized, you could find out, okay, when did they get naturalized? We had to wait to, what, 1900, 1910 in the federal census, where they would ask questions like that. And after the Civil War, many of those censuses asked about the veterans, a number of cases, even what regiment and company had they served in, and that can help you find potentially pension records or military service records. So there's lots of valuable information in these censuses if you can find them. And that's going to be the one trick. So the questions you want to ask if you're going to look for somebody uh, is become familiar with the content and limitations. So you want to look, do the research about the records, and probably spend as much time about the records learning that as you do working in the records themselves. 
And these are the questions you want to ask. First of all, was there a census taken? And it's going to depend on the state and the territory. And did they do the whole state? What counties were there in the state at that time? Did the records survive? In a lot of cases they did, a lot of cases, sorry they took a census, but the records are all gone. In what form are the records? Are they originals? Are they microfilms, transcriptions, summaries? And did anybody index them to make it a little bit easier so you don't have to go page by page by page by page? And then where are they? Because they're not going to be at the National Archives. They're going to be at a state historical society, a genealogical society, may have it, a state archive. So you have to figure out where are the records. So how do you find that out? Well, two good sources, and I brought for show and tell. Uh, Ann Lanehart in 1992 did this nice little book. She'd started doing just a couple places in New England, and then the National Geological Society said, well, could you talk about all the states? I uh, know New England, so let me go and do some research. And she found a lot of the existing books that were out there weren't necessarily correct. So she did that one, and then Bill Dollarhide, this is now his second edition, and this has as much census substitutes as state records. And this is the eastern states. There's a central and a western. They're upstairs. There's your call numbers. I did that work for you, so I just go. Uh, and it used to be two volumes, and now he's gone to three. And there's lots of information about all kinds of these census substitutes. In every state he goes through, okay, what's in family search, what's in ancestry. And in most cases, he has the URL of at least in 2016 when he published where you can find those. So in addition to the hardcover, they also sell the electronic version. And you probably want to get the electronic version because then you can just click on that particular link and it'll take you there other than trying to type some of these long and cryptic links that sometimes you find. They've also done sort of individual ones. If you just really have one state, here's the Texas book. So what he basically did was they took the big book, three volumes covering all the states, and just pulled out, he always has one part about the federal census because he's done a number of books about federal census. And then in addition has the specifics for that particular state. So if you're only doing one or two states, maybe you want to save a little bit of money, uh, you can just go ahead and get the book for that particular state. Online at Family Search, you can go through and find, and you have this in your handout, the URL. They have one page, and there's all the states listed with their flags, includes the District of Columbia. And you just click on that link, and it'll take you to the page about that state, and you can find there what records were done, you know, what censuses were taken, what exists, where are they. If they have them, they'll have links to that. But again, the wiki that Family Search has is not exclusive to what's on Family Search. They have links that will take you to other places. So that's another, and that's of course freely available. And then one of the older books that's back again is the Red Book. This is through Ancestry, and it's been on RootsWeb, and RootsWeb sort of had to get shut down for a number of problems. It's being resurrected, and recently the Learning Center used to be an Ancestry where you could find the other big book was the Source, but the Red Book, well, it's back. And you have this URL in the handout again, and you can see there's the background information about all kinds of records for whatever state you may want to look at or particular topics as well. And that's available on Ancestry now. And of course the books are in libraries as well. Ancestry also has state research guides, which are little four, maybe eight pages maximum uh, links that have information about the particular states and the, we'll get down the page, all the different states, and you click on that. So again, you're looking to see, this is an example for New York. Okay, did they do a census? Does the census exist somewhere? Where can I find it? So there you can see those state censuses, the ones they have. 
Uh, in some cases, they'll have some of the extra ones, and they did the 1892 census as well. So you're trying to find people in New York, you don't have an 1890, well, the state did an 1892 census. <laughs> and this was going through my stuff. Family Tree Magazine, just a year ago, their February 2018 issue has a centerfold. These are the kind of centerfolds genealogists like, right? <laughs> <laughs> you open it up and go, oh, wow, look at that. And this is a listing here of every state and all the different state censuses in case where there's still territories. So that's the February 2018, last year's version of Family Tree Magazine. And we still have territories. Uh, we have Guam, we have Puerto Rico, we have the Virgin Islands, the US Virgin Islands, not the British ones, Samoa, and the Northern Marineras Islands. So we still have some territories, and in fact, Dollar Hyde did a book of the territories as well. So if you have relatives from one of those places, there's where you can find the information in his book. Okay, just your background in history again of how did we start out. Here's 1790, it goes to 1840, then 1850 and 1900, and then all the way up to 1960 is when we added by then the last two states of Alaska and Hawaii. But we start out with, again, the green shows what were territories as opposed to the orange or the state boundaries and the white current states. Uh, it's sort of tricky, and I had to get a reminder which were the 13 colonies. And by the way, Maine was part of Massachusetts, and it later became the state of Maine. Uh, but you can see how things sort of grew and where we acquired these territories and then that would be the case where you're looking for the territorial censuses in addition to the states. And I went through and put together this map working from uh, Ann's book in that case of how many state censuses were taken. Doesn't mean they all still exist, but at least what did they start with? Now I'm originally from Pittsburgh and my relatives from Pittsburgh, some went over to Ohio. Well, ha ha. No state censuses were ever taken in those places. On the other hand, Mississippi just did tons of them, as they did in Washington and Oregon. And you can see some of the others, the purples, again, have lots and lots. So sort of look at the states that you work at. This is how many were taken. And I'll show you a little bit later how many are, might be available. So let's look first at territories. And why were territories doing censuses? Well, after we had the Revolutionary War and we had the 13 colonies, they had picked up a lot of land grants said all the way over from the coast to the Mississippi River. So you had this part that were sort of parts of the colonies, but really weren't as such as now they're gonna call them states. So they sort of figured out, well, one of the things we're gonna to wanna to do is make these things into states. Now that we have a United States, and they first had to talk the colonies into giving the land to the central government. Uh, one of the schools I applied to in Cleveland is called Case Western Reserve. Why Western Reserve? That's the Western Reserve of Connecticut. Connecticut's land grant went all the way over there. So they had to go to Connecticut and said, could you please give us this land and then we'll divide it up eventually into states. So Thomas Jefferson sat down and said, well, let's figure out where the rules, how are we gonna make them into states? So as they first become a territory, they had to have a governor, a secretary, and three judges. And then he said, then we'll say if they have 5,000 male residents, sorry, ladies, Abigail Adden said, remember the ladies, but John didn't. <laughs> then you have 5,000 male residents, you could have a legislature and a non-voting delegate. You know, Puerto Rico has a non-voting delegate to Congress, or a territory. And then once you get up to 60,000 free inhabitants, then you could apply to Congress for statehood, and then if Congress decides yes, you could become a state. But you had to have 60,000 people, and how did you know you had 60,000 people? You had to count them, you had to do a census. Okay, so this was done in 1787 under the Articles of Confederation, if you remember your history, those didn't last very long. And then we started the We the People in 1789, the Constitution, 
So they essentially took those basic rules and incorporated into the Constitution. So it's in Article 4, Section 3, Clause 1. New states can be administered admitted by the Congress. No new state can be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, unless they secede. And no state can be formed by a junction to two or more states or parts of states without the legislatures of that state or states agreeing as Congress. Because there was one time with the Native Americans in Georgia, and they were getting harassed, and you know we had the Trail of Tears, and they pushed them all out. At one point, they said, well, if we just make our own state inside Georgia. And I said, uh, sorry, we're not giving you permission to do that. You can't do it. Go to Oklahoma. OK, so Vermont, Kentucky, Maine, West Virginia were formed from other parts of states. Vermont, it was always New Hampshire and New York. Is this yours or mine? No, my territory goes to here. No, mine goes to here. Uh, Kentucky picked up. Maine, again, was part of Massachusetts. And then after Virginia seceded, the people in the western part of Virginia decided they didn't really want to secede. So you get permission from the Virginia legislature who seceded? Said, no, we'll just, oh, we'll accept you. OK, welcome. So. That's how we got it. Of course, here in Texas, we were a republic in California, so they were never territories. But all the other states, other than the original 13 and these, at one time or another were territories and had applied to become a state. <coughs> so why were they doing territorial censuses? Well, you had to have that 60,000 people. You had a legislature who's representing which part of the state. You've got so many legislators in which part of the state. And then, of course, you always want to collect taxes, so you want to know who's out there, who am I going to get the money from. Now, of those territorial censuses for genealogists, those that survive, you may find they're incomplete. A lot of them aren't indexed. In 1885, there was a federal census of New Mexico and Dakota territories. In addition, Florida, Nebraska, and Colorado. This was a federal census. Everybody but the Dakota territories sent them in to Washington, D.C., and the National Archives had them, but not Dakota. The archives don't have the Dakota 1885 census. It's in North and South Dakota. Ancestry and family search between the two of them have most of the existing territorial census records available online. So again, you have to pay attention to what counties were there at the time. And hopefully you're familiar with the Newberry Library where you can go through and look at the history of any state and when counties were formed. So for example, when Texas was a republic, was there a Dallas County? And if you had people living around here, how would they have been listed? Well, they were in Nacogdoches at the time because there was no Dallas County until 1846. So you can go through any given state. You have the link again to the Newberry Library's page, and you go through, get to the map, click, and learn about all the counties, when were they formed, from which counties were they formed, if you're trying to find out where your relatives are. And for example, here's Arizona Territory, three districts, there's three judges. You want to know where this district was part of? The darn Gadsden Purchase. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Minnesota, you have to be careful. Anybody here from Minnesota? Have ancestors, relatives of Minnesota? You know, what's your stereotype of Minnesotans? They're almost like Canadians, right? They're sort of nice, friendly kind of people. Yeah, they have the Minnesota Vikings, but they didn't really intimidate my Pittsburgh Steelers years ago in the Super Bowl. We beat them. So. But it turns out, in 1857, they were getting ready to become a state. So the federal Congress said, OK, we'll give you $20,000 to do a census. But it turns out the Republicans and the Democrats in 1857 and thereabouts in Minnesota were at each other's throats. Sounds familiar? We got over it at one time. Maybe we'll get over it again. And they're fighting about who's going to be the governor, who's going to have the governor. And you had to have votes. So they had votes for governors. And then you got all these voting returns. 
And it was just sort of like we always had the, the late returns from Cook County, Illinois, when the first Mather Daly was in charge. Well, they had these newly formed counties down in the southwestern part of the state, and they were getting all these votes from there. And I said, wait a minute, we got some Native Americans, there's some trappers down there, a couple of trading folks, but where are all these people coming from? And in fact, when they applied to become a state, one of the other things you had to do is form a constitution. So you have to have get together have a state constitution convention. Well, it turned out the Republicans had theirs and the Democrats had theirs. And the Congress said, well, you got to pick. You can only have one constitution. You're going to be one state. So they finally agreed on what it should say, and then all the legislators had to sign it. Well, the Republicans didn't want to sign any piece of paper that had Democratic signatures on it and vice versa. So there were, in fact, two sheets of paper with the signatures. The white one was the Republicans, and at that time, the red-tinted one were the Democrats. So again, they're trying to fight in who's going to control the state and how many votes are you going to get. So you're doing a census. And here is Cottonwood County, Minnesota in 1857. And we see at the top of the list is Wilson uh, Melbourne and some of his family. And then he's got a couple laborers and some other folks. He's born in Maryland, he says, in 1823. So you go try to find Wilson Melbourne, even when they came back and did the federal 1860 census. Or any hey, of these other people, they're not there. They made them all up so they could have votes. So just because you found it in the census doesn't mean it's true. So what about Wilson Melbourne? Well, this is the closest Wilbert Wilson, I think, maybe where he ended up. So you have to learn about the history, the place and time where your ancestors lived as you're doing the records to figure out who made the records, why did they make them? They wanted to have votes, so they just made up people. Okay, that was the territorial censuses. What about the states? Well, Illinois is one example. In 1818, decided every five years, starting 1820, we're going to do a state census. And there were debates back then among statisticians is 10 years is probably too long, is five years enough? Some places decide three. Germany, when they did that, decided to go with threes. So they did all these state censuses. They were taken. Do the records all exist? Well, let's see, then 1848, they finally said, okay, we'll go with the ones on the 10 years, so we won't do our own 1850 or 1860 census separate from the federal, we'll believe the federal one. So, but they were still doing them on the, the fives. And then 1870, they finally figured, nah, it's going to be too much trouble There's so many people, we'll just do, let the feds do it every 10 years. So... Only 1820 state census, 55, 65, reasonably intact. Most of the other ones were lost. Half of the 1840 state census was lost. You still have the 1840 federal census. So again, did they do a census, but does it still exist? Here is the 1855 sentence for Sangamon County in Illinois. And there's this guy named A. Lincoln Esquire. You ever heard about him? And here he is, he's got males, two under 10, one 10 to 20, and one 40 to 50. Well, there's Abe, Robert, William, and Thomas. One woman, 30 to 40, that's Mary Todd, and a woman, 10 to 20. They had no daughters. But if you read up, she would either have a relative or a servant, a maid, to help her out. So that was there. And he had the two pupils, I guess William counted as a pupil, and he had $200 worth of livestock, probably a horse or two, among others. Here's a picture from my research that one of my mother's cousins sent me. This is my grandfather. This is 1905. This is some of the brothers. This is Uncle Barney. This is Uncle Barney's son. Uncle Barney's wife had died. So he, his son and daughter, moved in with my grandfather, my great-grandparents. His my grandfather's mother was his sister. But they had this guy visiting, a cousin, and my mother's cousin had written on the back of the photo, yes, yes. This is John McClory, 
visiting from Trowbridge. Well, Uncle Barney's mother, my great-great-grandmother, was Ann McClory. I said, oh, there's McClory's, and they're in Trowbridge, Illinois. And lo and behold, if you look back, that was a 1905 picture, but in 1865, there's John McClure E. Was he pronouncing it or telling the guy how to spell it? McClure E. Oh, oh God. And here's the family and their livestock and the grain, and it produced 100 pounds of wool. And in fact, I discovered there's a whole www.mcclurie.com webpage, which is all my McClurie's done from this family, this wing of the family. And that allowed me to find my great, great, great grandparents McClurie. Okay, 1885, as I mentioned, 1880, Congress said, states will go halvesies with you if you do an 1885 census. So we'll pay half, you pay the other half. So the states of Florida, Nebraska, and Colorado said, okay, we'll do that. And New Mexico and the Dakota territories said, we'll do it as well. So this is a federal census. So like I say, other than Dakota, the others all got sent back to Washington and the archives have them. But now Family Search and Ancestry has even the Dakota ones. And it sort of looks like the usual sort of questions they were asking back then. But this was done in 1885, not 1880. And of course, maybe they sort of knew something. Somebody could see into the future because 1890 census, uh, we don't have that. At least we have an 1885 for those states. So like I say, Dakota never sent them to the archives, but they kept them in their state archives. North Dakota State University has an index and a transcription, not the originals. The schedules for what was the northern half were 50 of the 56 counties, and that's available on microfilm. But it's also now on Ancestry and Family Search, so you can get it free on Family Search. And Ancestry has all of that, so it is available online now, so you don't necessarily have to go to Dakotas to do it. In 1885, they also did the Civil War veterans, both Union and any Confederate veterans that got all the way up into the Dakotas. And the South Dakota Historical Society has <coughs> surnames and counties. The mortality and veteran schedules for North Dakota are not online, but they're in Bismarck. Do we have anybody here from Iowa or Iowa relatives? You are so lucky. I want to marry somebody from Iowa just so I can do that research. So I'm available. <laughs> this is probably the ideal census. If you ever want, as a genealogist, what they should ask. So they use, you know, round up all the usual victims sort of things. But then they said, okay, were you foreign born? Were you naturalized? How many years have you been in the States? How many years have you been in Iowa? What are the names of your parents? Could we have your mother's maiden name, please? And where were they born? If they're still living, how old are they? And by the way, where were they married? So, so you get things like that. They have over on the other page was the fathers. But here's the mother's full maiden name of mother, where they knew it. Some cases they didn't know. And where were they born? And most of these folks, at least, had been multi-generations in Iowa, because most of them, the parents, had been married in Iowa. But that's available for everybody that was in Iowa in 1925. And then, well, my military service, you've been working, uh, were you sick because you had a communicable disease? How much money did you lose because you were sick? What church did you belong to? Then you can find the church records. How much is your house insured for? So lots of great information. Okay, so where are these records? Again, many of them are on Ancestry and Family Search. Family Search you can do free from anywhere. Ancestry, if you don't have an account, just go to the library. They have the library edition and you can get on the terminals there. My heritage has picked up a couple and uh, Find My Past has a few as well, but they really got them from, as I'll show you, Family Search. So, microfilm copies at the Family History Eye where they don't loan them anymore, but they're digitizing everything. So, 
Hopefully they'll get them all digitized. A number already are. Again, some of them will be at state archives or historical societies. In Family History Library, you go do the keyword search on state census records. And that again pulls up that page with all the names and the flags. I sort of went through again, created this map of the most complete records are for these states in green. So of all the censuses I took, remember Mississippi did a whole lot. So most of them are, still exist and they're at uh, Family History Library. If they're not online, they'll be digitizing them. And here they have records for a lot of the other states as well at the Family History Library, in most cases, Family Search. Ancestry picks up these states. So if you go back, for example, Alabama, for some reason, Family Search doesn't have but Ancestry does. So between the two of them, you can find most of what is available. I sort of found them. My Heritage has a few. If for some reason you have an account with them, but not with Ancestry. And Find My Past is partnered with Family Search. So these are already on Family Search. And why they pick some, but not all, I don't know. Okay, so we're here in Texas, so I thought I could focus in a little bit more about, well, about Texas and surroundings. And of course, we have the case of Louisiana, was part of France, and New Mexico, of course, like Texas, was part of Mexico, which then was part of New Spain. And then Oklahoma, of course, we have Indian Territory, so lots of special things. So Texas, before the Republic, they did some censuses, the Padrone of 1826 of Austin's colony, the Anascocito, which is like Beaumont, Port Arthur, the DeWitt colony was next to the Austin colony. I'll show you a little bit about this, 1829 to 36. And then there's an 1835 residence of Texas, not really a census, that's what they're calling it. The Padrone is at the general land office not the State Archive or any other place, they have the original. Uh, you can go through and see Estefan F. Austin or Santiago Bay, who of course we all know is Jim Bowie. So, because it's in Spanish. And that's at the General Land Office. Okay, Escocito again was over here, Beaumont Port Arthur area. What's available is a transcript of a photostat of what's in the Library of Congress. So it's a handwritten copy or a written copy from pictures of what's there. It's on Microfish, the Clayton Library has it, UT Austin, of course it's in Baytown, and the Family History Library has that one. The DeWitt Colony, they look at it and said, don't think they got everybody on there. So again, it's not really a census. It would be sort of a sense of substitute. Cross your fingers, the people you're looking for were listed. Just because they're not on the list doesn't mean they weren't there. So, uh, but to count up besides people, how many cattle, donkeys, and pigs they had as well. So, and they supplemented by lands from the land grant records. And you had talked about looking at the deeds and how you got land. And in Texas, depending on when you came, that decide, and were you married or single, how much land you got. So you had to prove when did you get here, and then that implies, oh, we know you were here at a certain date, makes a sense of substitutes. For the DeWitt colony, that's online through a and &M. Then there's this book, First Census of Texas, done by Marion Day Mullins. I checked the catalog, and this is not upstairs, as best I can tell, but the Grapevine Library has it. And she says at the beginning of the book, and she's got some additional lists, it says, in 1829 to about 36, it seems like somebody was doing the census. Because there's a lot of Hispanic names, we think maybe it was the Mexican government. It just wasn't the Anglos, count how many Anglos there were. But the records were found at the municipalities, not in Mexico and they're now all at the Texas State Archive. And she has all these lists in alphabetical order. And then 1830, Gifford White again really used these different sources, and were they really censuses or not, 
to put together what he calls who was here in 1830. And again, that's in many cases the land office, the people says, I was here in 1825. And they say, oh, you get 640 acres. Or no, you were single, you get 320 or whatever. Uh, also another one they had in some cases when the Anglos were coming in had to be sponsored and it would list, he has in the book, the sponsors of the person, the name of the person, the sponsor. So that's your friends, associates, neighbors, whatever. Uh, there's an 1835 census at the Texas Institute for Texan Cultures. Uh, they have a number of things, one of which is this 1835 census for places like Nacogdoches, northwest of Nacogdoches, would be sort of Dallas, if there was anybody up there that they were counting, because there was no Dallas County back then. But it varies from where you look, and these are all online, and you can look, here's one part of St. Augustine, and it gives the name of the husband, and he's married, these folks are all Catholics, what's his profession, here's the wife, and here's all the kids, and here's how old they are. But then you go look at another part of it, and here's William Garrett and his wife, and here's his sons, and then we get the servants, George Tillman, Fanny, Moses, Lucy. Uh, anybody want to guess what race these servants were? But it lists names, at least, in some cases, Mariah is Maria's child as is Henry, and probably Reuben, one month old as well, and Moses and Lucy are married. So it gives you some information that way. Then you look west to the Angelina River, and oh, why, here's the wife's maiden name, but we're only gonna say how many kids they have, we're not gonna tell you their names. And you look closely, here is G.J. Dykes, it looks like his sons, Lubbock and Levy, Levi maybe, with their wives, but now his current wife is 15 years old. I went back, double checked that. So she is not Lovick's and Levi's mother, but they already have a child. Okay, so for the Republic of Texas, there's no known national census. There's hints of things. Nobody can find any of the records. Again, white used land records. That's not really a census as such. So what about New Mexico? Well, it was part of New Spain and then Mexico, and they were doing lots and lots of censuses. So this is before it's a territory, even. And U.S. Gen Web Archives has the 1750. They did lots of others before it became 1845. Then we have the Mexican-American War. Then it's going to become part of the United States and a territory. The Clayton Library, of course, obviously in Albuquerque and Las Cruces have all those. For Oklahoma, the eastern part was Indian Territory, the western part was Oklahoma Territory, and then there was the neutral strip. And if you live there, you better have two firearms and don't sleep and keep your boots on. It was anything but neutral, and that was really the Wild West. So the federal censuses of what was Indian country were done by the marshals of Missouri and Arkansas. And again, those early years, the marshals were the enumerators, and they picked people to be marshals because they had such good handwriting, right? I got one in my 1860 in Pittsburgh, and it's almost like a horizontal line. It's like M. Is that Meissner? What was he trying to do? Uh, they only listed, though, the Native Americans who were off the reservation and paying taxes. Now, the civilized tribes did their own censuses at certain times. And then the Oklahoma Territory in 1890 did certain counties, that's on Ancestry. Uh, the Native American census they did is on the back of the pages of the rest of the territory. So when you're paging through, then go to keep paging to the end of the, the virtual microfilm, it's now digital images. Uh, 1907, all that's left is Seminole County. And then they were doing separate Indian census rolls uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and NARA has those, and they're available on Ancestry in Fold 3. So there's lots out there. Here's an example of the territorial census. 
place of birth, years in US, years in Oklahoma. Uh, in many cases, they were looking, were they the soldiers? So they naturalized if you're a soldier, can you read or write? Uh, I like their uh, Richard Smithwick from Ireland. I have some bottles of his beer in my refrigerator. Everybody knows Guinness, but the second most popular beer in Ireland is Smithwick. So he might be related to that. And here's uh, Cherokee Nation, 1900 census. Then you're looking to see when was the individual enrolled and when were his parents enrolled. In some cases, it goes into good detail exactly what page in which role are they listed. Okay, what about Arkansas? Well, they said in 1820, we're going to do it every two years. We're going to do a census. We'll have the sheriffs do it. And they started doing it, 23, 25, 27, 29. Well, they lost 25, 27, 29. 23, only Arkansas County. 23 and 29, Ancestry says it's in their online, you can search compiled census and census substitutes. If you go upstairs, there's the book. I've looked at the book. I've entered names that are in the book in Ancestry. You can't find anybody. So I don't think they really have the 23 and 29, but it's upstairs. And here's again what's available for 29. Some cases are the counties, some are just indices. So again, you have to do that research. And you have a few others as well. They did a 1911 veteran census and a little over half of them, the originals are at the History Commission, but they're on microfilm, hopefully getting digitized. Louisiana was part of France, so we bought it from them, right? Uh, and they did a number of different censuses. Uh, of course, they're all in French, right? Just like New Mexico, all be in Spanish. Uh, by 1810, we'd bought Louisiana territory, so that's a federal territorial census. And all the federal censuses for all the other states that were territories at the time were included in the federal census. So when you get into the 1820, 1830, just because they're a territory doesn't mean they didn't do the census. There's one there. They did 1911 census of the Confederate veterans and widows. And some of those are in Orleans Parish. Some of the originals may be at the actual parish courthouses still. Here's an example of the index, and you can see who they were, where were they employed, when were you married, if you were the widow. It's an index, it's not an original, but you just saw. So again, the question to ask is, did they take a state or territorial census? Then you have your fingers crossed. Which were the counties that are surveyed, in some cases survived, and what was the name of the county your people lived in at that time? You don't look for Dallas County in 1840 or 1845. There was no Dallas County until 46. Did the record survive? What's the form? Does somebody have the originals and microfilm? Is it just a summary or a transcription? Is there an index? Yes, yes, you hope for that. Otherwise, you have to go page by page by page by page. And where are these records? Are they online? Or are they back at the original state or a county courthouse, an archive, a historical society, whatever? So but hopefully that gets you interested in maybe looking to see, did you have some relatives in some state or territorial censuses? So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. There's a handout, should be online. I sent the electronic one to Lisa, and then that way, the links that I have with the references, you can just click. And one of the things of doing things with links to the internet is every time before I give the presentation, I have to check all the links, so I did. So, other questions? Yes?
Okay. Man, you've seen Tony's ear recorded this, so if this didn't put you to sleep the first time, tonight, or when he gets it up online, you can go view it again. See that on instant replay. <laughs> was it a touchdown or wasn't it? <laughs> uh, yes? Louisiana was what you call a federal land state, and that is that the veterans, like in the War of 1812, were awarded lands then, mm -hmm. and then they sold their head rights and their patents, and they finally all settled down. But there are uh, there are censuses like state, and there wasn't a state, but there must have been territorial censuses. Louisiana. Yeah, they did, like I say, from 1810, they did for anything that was Louisiana Territory, the whole Louisiana Territory, they did a census, a federal census of the people. So it wasn't done by the Louisiana Territory, it was done by the U.S. government. But yeah, then, like you say, that's when you get into these census substitutes in Dollar Hyde's books in particular, of there were lots of times Texas was the case. They wanted people to come to Texas. How do you entice them? We'll give you land. Okay, and then part of it in the Texas case of how soon you got here, the sooner you got here, the more land we gave you. You know, were you here when they were fighting the war or did you come after independence when it was the Republic? And like I say, were you married or single? decide how much land you got. So that was all through the General Land Office, and they have lots and lots of those kinds of records. So that's a sense of substitute. And that's not the only case we had, where I grew up in Pittsburgh, if you look across where the football and baseball stadiums are, across the Allegheny River, that was a separate town of Allegheny. And in Pittsburgh, particularly after the Revolutionary War, there weren't all that many people living in Pittsburgh. It was really sort of a village. But they started doing, even for guys that fought in the Revolutionary War, you know, the government didn't have any money. They had a lot of debts because they had to borrow all this money to fight the war. And now they're just starting out and they're going to figure out how we're going to tax people. So they gave land to people. And as you said, in some cases, the people said, oh, land, okay, great. Let's go, we'll move there and settle, I've got my land. In other cases, well, I'm sort of happy living in Philadelphia, but they gave me this land and speculators would come by and say, you know, give me a hundred bucks, give me a title to that land, and they did it. So, but you can sort of follow those things. So those are census substitutes, uh, and there's tons of different things. Like I said, you could even get to the dog licenses if you need to. Think of all the kinds of records that you make that's out there that Amazon, we just heard about the Weather Channel has been selling your location data. So it's all out there now. You know, our, our descendants are gonna be overwhelmed with all the information. And I know where Bernard was at 11 o'clock on January 5th. He was over at the Dallas Library for some reason. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if not, then thank you very much. Sure. Right. Well, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your weekend. This has been a presentation of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your membership dues are supporting this and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, I hope you consider joining. You can become a member for as little as $35 a year, and you can join by going to our website, dallasgenealogy.org, and clicking on the Membership tab.